Uh, uh, yeah, 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 Ron. No, uh, Luke's good, mate. He's just grafting in in London, just non-stop, obviously, with the situation. Yeah. But he said, um, yeah, I remember when the lockdown was called, the social distancing started, whatever day, that was the 10th of March, whatever it was. He, I mean, he'd been grafting for two or three weeks prior to that with it. Yeah. You know? Um uh, yeah, and then and now here we are, Andy Hall. <laughs> Do us a favour, mate, um, for the benefit of people listening and watching. Uh, give us your, give us a brief background, military background. Sure. So, obviously, my name's Andy. Um, I started off joining the TA uh, when I was younger um, as a combat medic. My dad had done it for years. He did uh, telic um, as a medic. And as I sort of got to that stage in, in my life, it was something I thought I'd give a crack. Really sort of enjoyed it way more so than my actual civilian employment, which was as, as an apprentice at the time. Um, so you just invested more and more time in it to the point where I ended up uh, serving more time with the regular army on exercises and training and stuff uh, that it just made more sense to sort of head down that route. And so when the opportunity to come across, uh, do my regular class ones, uh, and joined 16 Medreg, um, I took it, uh, ended up in Afghanistan, uh, was attached to 2Para for uh, the majority of the, the tour, spent a bit of time with 2Para snipers and patrols, um, and then the rest of the time sort of bounced around D Company 2Para and, and, you know, people like that. Um, after that, I, you know, after that tour, uh, I left, obviously, and, and went to train as a nurse and went to university, uh, which was... I think as we, we spoke last time, um, not an easy transition to make from from a pretty decent tour with two power to, to university in the space of a couple of months was quite a shift in uh, in mindset, which wasn't easy to make. So, yeah, that's that's my background really. Yeah, I, when you mentioned that the other day when we were when we were chatting on the phone, that that was one uh, that was one of the things I thought flipping neck. That is it. It's that is hideous to do, um, and pe- you know, and and it's a, a difficult thing for people to understand. So that that was the 08 tour you were in, out with two power, weren't you? Two thousand eight. Uh, no, no, two thousand and ten. Oh, the second one. All right, yeah, and then yeah. and then so you leave Afghan, and within two to three months, you are out and you're sat in the university yeah. <laughs> in lectures with a bunch of students. Like, I remember the like day one of uh, proper nursing lectures. We all sat in this massive amphitheater, hundreds of other students. Uh, and uh, at the time, I was only twenty-one. Um, but, but nevertheless, I was still one of the older ones in the room. And they, you know, the lecturer says, "Right, as an introductory thing, I want you to turn to the person in your left and tell them what you've been doing over the summer." Uh, or what you've been doing for the last year or whatever it was and you know this girl turns to me he's like oh when I did a gap, gap yar in Bali and you know, diving and I was like that sounds really cool yeah awesome that sounds fantastic she's like and what did you do I was like well uh, I've been in Afghanistan for the last six months and she genuinely looked at me and went oh is that nice is it a good place to go what what do you do in Afghanistan is it like uh, you know is there diving there I said, like, fucking hell you no idea they and to be fair, the majority of people didn't, you know, have that much of an idea. Even at that point, it wasn't massively. I mean, it was definitely getting better. People's perception of what was actually happening out there was definitely better. It was more widely known. But there were still a lot of people, and still today, a lot of people live in their little bubble of what's important to them. And clearly, to, to her sitting next to me and to a lot of the people that I was at, at university with, you know, a conflict in a far flung land not being fought by them or anyone they know uh, is irrelevant to them. Um, yeah, fair, fair enough. I mean, they're pretty young kids. So, you know, it's probably better that they they don't know what's going on. To be fair, <laughs> what what was when did you decide to pull the pin on that? Um, that was whew, probably just before we deployed. Uh, I made my application to to go to uni. Um, and it no, was, I mean, yeah. when did you pull the pin on uni? Oh, flipping hell. Uh, how long did you, how long did you last? I made it through. You know, I, I qualified as a nurse. Um, ah. 
So, you know, and that's, that's how I ended up in Sierra Leone. Um, but it was a struggle. And I, I remember constantly, because obviously a lot of the, the guys that I was with as medics um, that left at the same sort of time, they all went and worked, you know, got jobs on the circuit, like offshore medic stuff um, or close protection medic stuff. And I must have sent an email to them, you know, probably once every two months being like, ah, oh, this sucks. I hate it. I don't want to be here anymore. I can't do it. It's, it's, it's just boring. There's too much academic stuff. It's not exciting. Can you get me a job with you guys? And they were like, yeah, you know, we can. You, you're pretty easy. Your background, your skills, everything else. Just go and do your offshore medic course, you know, and we can put a good word in for you. Um, but we really recommend that you, like, stick at it. Get your get your degree, get your diploma done, um, because once you're a nurse, you can film more. Um, so I, I eventually made you know made it through, uh, but it was a struggle. I you know I've never been particularly academic, um, and yeah, I wasn't a big fan of uni, uh, not at all. I, yeah, for some reason I thought he'd he binned it off, but that's mate, that's an epic. I, we, 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 I mentioned Luke. I remember when he was going going through it. I, it never it had never dawned on me just how tough. Um, just how tough uni can be for a bunch of different aspects, and then the studying that goes into being—I mean, you know, paramedic, nurse, the study that goes into that. Jesus, I'm glad I never. I'm glad I never got out of college to go to uni. <laughs> There's no way I would have passed it. It was, yeah. I mean, just the life in general, and it's it's kind of uh, toxic as well. For I think for for guys like me who came back quite young. Um, probably holding on to a little bit too much stuff from from their tour you know I, I went into an environment where I was living in student halls as well which was probably a bad idea um, so you know 18 19 year old uh, kids living in the same halls constantly leaving the kitchen in a mess uh, so it was just horrible to try and it, was just, it wasn't a, a you know they were good people I liked them they were good friends but um you know, completely different outlook and aspects of life. Um, so that was quite difficult. And then it's, it gets this sort of toxic feedback loop because they decide to go out on the lash. So I go with them. But I still hit it hard the same as I would if I was going out with the boys. Um, you know, and so my level of uh, intoxication would be sort of way up here whilst they were just sort of sitting around here somewhere. And uh, obviously, you know, everyone knows how, how drunk squaddies get. And uh, and the things that they do, and how how often they like to take off their clothes and things when they're they're drunk, and that doesn't quite go down as well with the student crowd as it does with your with your mates from from the regiment. So uh, yeah, that was a tough one as well. Um, and then you know, and so making friends, it was sort of like, oh, I'll go out with these guys, I'll make friends, we'll, we'll go out partying. But um, you get a few funny looks after a certain point, and then suddenly <laughs> like, oh, maybe maybe went a bit too far on that one. But, yeah. <laughs> how did the how did the, the the Sierra Leone trip come about? So you leave uni, you've got yeah. So it was a bit of a strange one. Um, I met a guy through a, a university society who, who's ex-military, um, a doctor, and uh, he was saying, "Oh, you know, what are you what are you planning to do once you qualify?" So, to be honest, I, I don't know. I'm not looking forward to joining the NHS. Um, I know I'm going to have to do two years on the wards, probably on a ward that I'm not particularly uh, interested in, but I need to do it uh, to get into the route that I do want to do, which is emergency medicine, intensive care, critical care, that kind of stuff. Um, and he's like, well, you know, I, I work with an organisation called the King's Sierra Leone Partnership, a fantastic little NGO, which is associated with King, King's College London. Um, and they have a partnership in uh, Sierra Leone. So they've partnered with the main government tertiary referral hospital uh, in the capital city, Freetown. Um, and all they're doing out there, or I say all they're doing, they're doing a, a huge job. But their main function is to help build up the capacity of that health facility um, and also the wider healthcare system in Sierra Leone. Um, now, Obviously, they've been doing that for a number of years. They would get a lot of uh, med students go out there to do their electives. They'd get other qualified doctors from the UK and elsewhere to come over and do uh, various stints on specific projects. Um, and so in 2014, 
beginning of 2014, I sent them an email. I was like, listen, I'm going to qualify as a nurse in June. Um, you know, this is my background. This is what I used to do. Uh, I've got a lot of experience in, in pre-hospital care and trauma. Uh, do you think there's anything that I could come out and help with? Um, I got an immediate reply sort of from the organisation uh, and particularly their country director, a brilliant guy called Oliver Johnson. Um, and he was like, yeah, let's have a chat. So we had a chat and we decided that I would come out after I qualified in sort of June, July uh, and run some really basic sort of trauma management and triage system implementation for the for the government hospital because they really didn't have anything. And the nurses weren't really up to speed on the sort of more modern ways of dealing with uh, with trauma. Um, and when you're in an area and in, in a country that's so resource poor, um, particularly within the healthcare system, you almost have to look at everything that they're doing as a pre-hospital intervention because they've only got the most basic kit. You know, the stuff that we were carrying in our in our Medbergens in Afghanistan was more advanced than than what they had in their sort of tertiary referral hospitals A and E department. Um, you know, if if they could have seen the kit that we had in RAPs or in the back of BFAs, you know, that would be decades ahead of, of wherever they are out there. Um, so I think that from that point of view, we could both see a lot of value in, in what I could bring. Uh, downsides to that was it's a really small NGO. They didn't have very much funding. Um, so it was all on me in order to fund it. So I went out, bought my visa, uh, bought my plane tickets, started sorting out accommodation. Uh, and about probably two or three weeks before I was due to leave, uh, I get a phone call from Ollie, um, and I've been seeing in the media that there's this Ebola outbreak in West Africa. It's very small. It's barely uh, uh, registering on anyone's radar. It's not in the mainstream sort of BBC News or ITV or any of the papers in the UK, but as it's somewhere I'm travelling to, you know, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on what's going on out there. Uh, and I noticed that there is this, this outbreak, WHO's reporting, there's a very small contained Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, so I get on the call with Ollie, uh, and he talks me through the situation, and it's really bad. Um, cases, case numbers in the east of the country, in a place called Kenema and Kailan, uh, has erupted, um, and it's it's moving its way towards the capital city, Freetown. Uh, Freetown, for anybody who hasn't been, is a really tiny city, really really densely populated, um, a city of about two million to three million people. No one really knows because they don't have much data on, on census records or anything. But it is very, very tightly packed. Um, and it's a very, very poor country and it's a very, very poor city. They don't have infrastructure in the city, really. Um, so he explains that that's the situation. They've had their first few cases in Freetown. Um, and they know, because they're public health experts, that this is going to explode. Um, and Ebola is a, a really nasty disease. It has anywhere between a 50 and a 90 percent fatality rate, um, which is, you know, probably one of the worst diseases out there to, to battle. Why, why is it so? Why is it? So, why is the mortality rate so high, mate? So, it's partly to do with the way that the the disease works. It's a hemorrhagic fever, and um, so it causes you to bleed. It causes membranes in your body to break down, and it causes your coagulation, so your clotting factors. Um, to not work as efficiently as they should. So where you would normally cut yourself, if you had a bolo, instead of where you would normally cut yourself, you know, put a little bit of pressure on, eventually it'll stop bleeding. If you've got a bolo, it's not going to stop bleeding, no matter how much pressure you put on it. And it gets worse and it gets worse and worse. So you don't even have to cut yourself. You'll start bleeding from the nose, from the mouth, from your sort of mucous membranes, from the eyes and ears. Um, your organs will start to fail and break down and you'll start bleeding internally. Um, and that's really difficult to, to manage, especially in low resource settings. So the sort of the lower end of the scale, the 50% fatality rates, that's what we were seeing. And that's what you would expect if you caught Ebola in the UK and were taken to a UK facility, 50%, probably, you know, the best survival rate you're going to see. Uh, in somewhere like West Africa, where the facilities are so incredibly poor, you know, you're looking at anywhere between 70 and 90 percent. Um, all the previous outbreaks of Ebola have been very small. They've been in very rural areas in places like the DRC in Uganda. Um, so they've been 
quite easy to contain because they're in quite rural, hard to reach places. Excuse me. Um, and with countries like the DRC, uh, the governments and the regimes in those countries, when those outbreaks happen, are quite repressive. So they'll they'll ring fence uh, a community or an environment where there's this outbreak, and they'll stop it moving, uh, physically stop it moving. And um, with West Africa, although it's a very, very hard area of the world to reach uh, for outsiders, it's got incredibly porous borders. There's a lot of uh, transit between the three countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia. If you look at uh, West Africa on a map, uh, Sierra Leone sits basically in the middle of Guinea and Liberia. Um, and there's a lot of trade that travels between the three. Uh, none of them have got any real uh, proper sort of border protection on, on the land side. So communities will cross the borders on little footpaths, on little roads. Um, major roads, yeah, there's crossing points and formal crossing points and things like that. But ultimately, you know, villages have been in the bush, have been cut in half by these borders that, you know, they don't recognise the border. It's, it's irrelevant to them. So it's very difficult to stop the disease and infected people moving from one country to the other. And that's how it got into Sierra Leone to begin with. It then spread very quickly down to the capital city because the roads in Sierra Leone, although pretty bad, are still, you know, you can still pass them. Um, so that's how it sort of arrived in Freetown. How, uh, sorry, from from contracting the disease or the virus, contracting the virus to fate, to to death, what is like the average length of time, the situation, is it days, is it weeks? Uh, it's a couple of weeks. Um, it depends. So again, the, the difficult thing with Ebola is unlike um, the flu or the common cold that will attack people of certain age groups or if they're immunocompromised or if they are um, you know, otherwise susceptible to it, Ebola is completely indiscriminate. I saw uh, really fit and healthy, um, you know, guys in their early 20s come in with Ebola and die very quickly. Uh, and yet I would see chain smoking 40 year olds come in with Ebola and survive in, you know, and be discharged four weeks later. And um, it didn't really make any sense. You couldn't look at a group or a demographic of Sierra Leoneans and think, oh, they're not going to do very well. And oh, they might do better. It was just across the board, you know, and to this day, we still don't really know why that is. Is that similar in the in the sort of ambiguity that COVID nineteen is operating? Apart from old people who are susceptible to death from flipping everything yeah. anyway, right? Uh, is it uh, a similar case? Um, from from what it looks like now, I'd say yeah, um, because and the the similar sort of thing happens with every infectious disease outbreak. We, we make these assumptions right really early on about what it's doing based on very small groups of patients that we've seen. As the outbreaks grow bigger and bigger and bigger, we start getting a bigger picture and a better view of what it's actually doing. Now, initially, everyone was talking about COVID-19 being something that only really kills old people. But the data we had, you know, that, that drove that, um, that assumption, I suppose, was coming from a, a country that wasn't giving us the complete picture they also weren't managing the outbreak particularly thoroughly in those early days so we weren't testing everyone you know china wasn't testing everyone so we didn't know exactly who was being infected and how they were faring through the infection what we do know with covid19 is that if you do get it you may end up having no symptoms and being totally fine you might have mild symptoms and be a bit under the weather or you might be have more severe symptoms the determining factor for that is not clear at this at this point in time. We don't know why that happens yet. We know that certain people fare worse. So we know that uh, the older you are, the worse you're likely to fare. However, we have seen anomalies, um, you know, where people in there, you know, over the age of 100 have managed to survive and be discharged. Uh, it's not a complete death sentence for anyone who gets it uh, or any demographic of people who gets it. Um, and we've also seen, you know, young guys in their 20s die from it. I think a case this week or even today, you know, a, a young 20 year old with no underlying health conditions uh, died from COVID-19. 
So we're starting to see a bigger picture of, of how that disease is working. Uh, more research is being done. But ultimately, it's not the same story as, oh, it's just a flu. It's just something that happens to old people. That's what we thought right at the beginning when we had very little information. We now know a lot more. Even in such a short period of time, we know a lot more. Um, and it is starting to look more and more indiscriminate. One of the big problems, uh, particularly for healthcare workers that we're seeing, uh, and the reason why a lot of healthcare workers who are contracting it are dying, is when you're looking after a patient with an infectious disease, if you're looking after them at the point where they're getting incredibly sick and at the point where they're dying, they have an incredibly high, the patient has an incredibly high viral load. And so if you get exposed to that amount of virus, obviously your chances are going to be dramatically reduced as well. So the, the issues that we've got in the UK and globally about personal protective equipment or PPE that's actually a lot more serious for healthcare workers than maybe the politicians realise. It's not quite, it's not the same as just saying, oh, you know, put on a mask and some gloves and go and treat that person. That might be okay. A mask and gloves might be all right if they're really mildly symptomatic. You might catch a little dose and you might get sick or you might get very unwell. But if you're having to look after incredibly unwell people in places like intensive care and you can't use the optimum amount of PPE, if you're being told that it's a scarce resource, which it shouldn't be, um, then you, you, know, you stand a much lesser chance of survival if you catch that, that virus. If you're happy, mate, we'll come back to COVID-19 in, in a bit. Um, uh, yeah, as long as you're happy, because you've you got a much better understanding of it than, than, than most. Um, so, so Sierra Leone, you, you hit, where were we? Are you talking, we were talking about why it was why the fatality rate was so high there yeah. um and you, we were a couple of weeks so it's a couple of weeks before you're due to go you get told about ebola but it doesn't seem to be that serious yeah um and so we sort of we monitor it for a few more days and then he gets back in touch and the situation's got much worse cases have started rocketing in freetown um and so the organizations decided they're going to pull all their staff out they're not an emergency response organization, you know, so they're not set up to do that. They don't have people with that skill set um, to do, you know, they're not an MSF and they're not an, a Red Cross. They, that's not their job. They're there to develop health systems. And if the health system's crumbling, it's very hard to do that job. So their office in London said to Ollie, you know, send everyone home, get them out now while we still can, because we just don't know what's going to happen. So Pretty much all the volunteers went home. Uh, Ollie gave me a call, told me what was going on um, and explained what the situation was and what was happening. Essentially, their chief medical officer, a really fantastic Spanish infectious disease doctor called uh, Marta Lado, she had refused to leave. As far as she was concerned, there was only one other infectious disease doctor in the country at the time, uh, a Sierra Leonean, who unfortunately died, Dr. Khan. Um, and so she was going to stay and do whatever she could to try and help. Uh, Ollie was going to come back to the UK and fight and try and get the, the UK government, uh, but also King's College London and, and the King's Sierra Leone Partnership to scale up their operations and come back in a big way uh, and do what needed to be done to help uh, Sierra Leone. Um, at this point in time, no, you know, the other aid agencies, the MSFs, they were trying to scale up. But if you look at the world at that period of time, they were already deployed in places like South Sudan, Yemen, Guinea, Liberia. So they were really um, quite overstretched as it was. 2014, right? Yeah. So, you know, I asked what, what the overall plan was for them, and that's, that's what he told me. Um, I said, was anybody else staying to help out Marta? Uh, and he said, no. Um, and he said he was really worried. He, he expressed a, a significant amount of concern for her, obviously, because the, the rate at which uh, cases were rocketing was, was quite dramatic. But also the number of healthcare workers they'd already lost uh, by that point, just a couple of months into the outbreak, was, was horrific. You know, we're seeing it in the UK at the moment, which is one of the things I find um, really heartbreaking, is that these were issues that we saw in very resource poor countries during outbreaks where healthcare workers are getting infected and dying because they don't have access to PPE. And I'll be honest, at the time in 2014, 
I sat there thinking, oh, God, well, thank God this would never happen in the UK. Uh, and now we're, we're seeing exactly the same thing happening in the UK. So that's particularly ups, upsetting for me and a lot of my colleagues that were there. It, it's, uh, it's, it's happening ac- across the world as well, isn't it? I yeah. know America, I know the USA, I, I've got the same issues and, and people like yourself and, mm. and I can't remember his name, uh, a, a well-known virologist out there. Of they've they've said, look, we've know about we've known about this stuff for a long time, and yeah. we've been flagging it up for a long time, and the preparation that needs to be made because it will come, it will come to first world countries, to the first world in a big way, and now look where we're at. I mean, I think I think I read somewhere, I heard somewhere that the USA again, we've gone off track here from Ebola, but I, I read or heard some of the USA that part one one of their items of PP. Or might be to do with the ventilators or something else. Every it's only made in one place, and it is like it's all down to one production facility in one country. It might, it, in fact, it might be, it might be, um, it might be Puerto Rico, you know, or somewhere like that. It's all there, and yeah. that was getting flagged. If we have a problem with this place, we've got no none of this type of PPE. And lo and behold, they've had a drama, and they can't, they can't go. It's hey, and it, you know the organisation I'm working for today at the moment. Um, we're trying to source PPE uh, for our staff, the same as every other medical organisation out there, and we're coming up against those same challenges. Um, and and you're right, it's the particularly frustrating point is that in 2016, I think if I'm right, the UK government ran a big planning exercise. They brought all the departments in and said, right, we know a pandemic is coming. Uh, We thought it was Ebola at the time and it caught us off guard and we ended up spending billions of pounds to get it under control. But thankfully we got it under control, but there's going to be another one and it's going to come soon and it's going to hit us hard. So we need to plan for it. They did this huge planning exercise and they realised how dire the situation was in terms of all our PPE is made abroad. You know, if those supply chains get cut, we're screwed. You know, lots of our drugs are made by pharma, you know, big pharma companies elsewhere in the world. If if other countries also need those drugs, we're going to struggle to get hold of them. So all of these problems were identified, and our ability to deal with those problems was also identified as being very poor. Now, we've had four years to address those issues as a, as a nation, as a country. Um, and we haven't done it, you know, and that is purely down to the government prioritising other aspects of, of national policy uh, over things like this. Um, and it, I think there's an element of sort of burying your heads in the sand. It's depressing. No one wants to hear about infectious diseases. There's more interesting and important things you know, people's minds to be dealing with. And so it's quite difficult sometimes to get traction uh, on particularly preventative measures because it's money that people see as being spent on, you know, nothing. Because what if it never happens? And so trying to build up uh, resilience in healthcare systems is really expensive to do, but it's more expensive not to do it. So we, I think the the metrics were done on the Ebola outbreak, for example, in 2014, um, uh, fantastic American NGO called Partners in Health did the maths and they worked out that it cost, I think, $2 billion of, of aid money was poured into Sierra Leone specifically just to get Ebola under control. And they worked out that if we'd just invested something like $40 million a year for 10 years previously in the healthcare system of Sierra Leone, they'd have been prepared and they'd have been ready for the outbreak and it wouldn't have got as big as it did thousands of lives would have been saved and the economy wouldn't have been damaged as bad as it was. But who wants to spend £40 million every year for 10 years for something that may not happen? Um, and, and that's... It's, it's, part, well, it's, it's part of the problem with... Uh, it's part of, the, part of the problem with having like systems, like the American system, like our system, in terms of how the countries run, having such a short term of the person, of the Premier in charge. You look at a, a prime minister. I mean, politics now. We won't stay here for long, but it's just a, just a point. 
you look at that kind of plan that you're talking, 10 years, 40 million, um, just in that example, when you get a new prime minister, you get a party on board and, and their term is four years. Well, take off yeah. the six months they need to bed in to the appointment when they get in. And then the last year of that is part on the campaign trail and, and campaigning. They've got two, two and a half years to make an impact. And like you're yeah. saying, if they're going to chuck 40 million, if they were to chuck 40 million, let's say it's UK, 40 million pound a year at something for four years, that's, uh, what, 120 million. Got that right. Parage, no, it's 100, 100, 120 million. Parage for maths, right? 120 million, which on the face of it amounts to nothing. And we would just be targeted by the opposition party going, we're wasting 120 million on this. It's, it's a, it's, yeah. I, I think the term should be longer. It should be like 10 yeah. years, man. It should be 10 years. Anyway, yeah. getting back on track. Sorry. <laughs> that's, but, that, but, that, but you're absolutely right, and it's and you, you see that all over the world as well. So when you give aid money to to countries like uh, Sierra Leone, again they'll they'll purpose that for things. The politicians will purpose that for things that they can see as or do that people will see as being great for the country. Um, if you can't see something, it doesn't exist. That's how pretty much the whole human race uh, thinks nowadays. There's very little understanding of what's happening in the background or why. Um, we live from day to day, and particularly in, in the poorer sections of society all over the world, we live hand to mouth. So, you know, it's the same case of why don't, uh, why doesn't everybody have a savings account? Well, not everyone can afford it. Um, and money for a rainy day doesn't seem that important if you're struggling to feed your family today. So, yeah. Um, so that's why. Sierra, of, yeah, eh? yeah that's, that's why Sierra Leone was in such a bad position when we went there because none of that investment had been done um so back to how i ended up there uh <laughs> i you know we had this conversation and um ollie was quite clear about how dire the situation was how bad it was getting and the fact that as an organization they couldn't guarantee that they'll be able to get anyone out if things went wrong or if people got sick um i was looking for an excuse if i'm honest to, to go and do something dangerous again uh, I was bored and um, it wasn't for any sort of, yay, let's go and save the world. It was really for me. I, I wanted to go and do something interesting. I wanted to go and do something cool um, that I could talk about for years to come. Um, and so I said, you know, tell Marta I'll be there in a week. Um, and I got on the flight and I flew out. Uh, and Sierra Leone's a, an interesting one. It's not exactly a tourist hotspot. You know, very few people travel there. Um, but nevertheless, even expecting to get on a plane that was pretty sparsely populated, you know, I was, I was kind of taken aback by the fact that when I got on the plane, there was maybe three, three or four people on there as well as myself. Um, there really wasn't anybody going to Sierra Leone. No one wanted to go back there. Um, we landed in the dark. Uh, I remember getting off the plane and it was just, you know, I've forgotten how oppressively hot uh, that heat is when you get into into tropical countries and how humid it was and you know so that that was one of my first thoughts when I got off the plane really was holy crap how am I going to survive out here in you know full PPE suits and uh, you know working you know 10 12 hours a day in that works when it's so blooming hot um, and to get to Freetown from the airport you have to get on a boat and cross a river uh, it's quite a big river um, and I remember getting off the other side and seeing Marta, who I'd only seen uh, and spoken to once or twice via Skype uh, at the jetty. Um, and I, you know, I walked up the jetty towards her and she gave me the, the biggest hug I've had from anyone that I don't know. Um, and I could absolutely feel the sense of relief just coming out of her at that point that somebody had come, anybody had come. And bearing in mind that I've only been a qualified nurse at this point for a few weeks, technically. So... I am, you know, if you could pick someone to come and help you fight an infectious disease outbreak, it probably wouldn't have been me, you know, that some, <laughs> some know-nothing brand new nurse from London who's never been to Sierra Leone before, sort of flying out and be like, yeah, I'll come help you. Um, so we, we did naturally what everybody does in an emergency uh, where people are you know, dying in their droves. We went and uh, got some beers and cigarettes and chilled out for a bit. Um, just before I went to bed that night, uh, she said, All right, I'm going to the hospital tomorrow. I'll be leaving about 6.37. Um, 
we'll you know make sure you're ready uh, and we'll get going. Uh, so I went to bed, woke up, um, packed my bag, took some scrubs with me and my stethoscope and whatnot. Uh, got in the truck and we started driving to the hospital. Uh, and at that point, you know, you could feel driving down the street to the hospital, you could feel the tension in, in the city. Was, no one knew what was going to happen. It was, uh, there was a real sort of uh, sense of, um, what the word is, pressure in the air. You could feel building. No one knew what was, what was coming, but they knew it was going to be bad. Um, and on the drive to the hospital, you, you really struck by, or I was really struck by the complete level of poverty um, in Freetown. You know, there are huge uh, sort of shantytown uh, slum communities uh, living right on the water's edge. Um, it doesn't have particularly great sanitation. Uh, water is in massively short supply. Um, so people would be queuing. You know, people think it's bad queuing for, for the supermarket at the moment in lockdown uh, London, for example. Uh, imagine that you, your particular section of town only has access to running water uh, one day a week. And it only comes to one standpipe in the middle of the street. And so everyone at four in the morning will be lining up ready for the water to be turned on with their jerry cans to fill up water. So even at that point, you know, alarm bells are ringing in my head. But holy cow, one of the biggest factors for any disease outbreak is water, sanitation and hygiene. Making sure you've got those basics in place to stop people from getting infected. These guys can't even get decent access to running water, even the fairly unclean water that they were getting. So that was quite sort of alarming as we were driving to the hospital. Um, and then when we got to the hospital, uh, seeing the, it was, it's a really old facility. It was built in colonial times and it hasn't really changed much since, you know, the include, you know, not just by looks, but also the, the type of equipment it's got hasn't particularly moved on very far. Um, so we went up to the office. She, Marta taught me how to put the PPE on, which I'd never done before. It's quite similar to doing uh, NBC drills um, in sort of like donning and doffing and cleaning your hands. It's, it's very systematic um, and it's incredibly hot. Uh, you know, I wore wearing scrubs um, and that was it, just a thin set of cotton scrubs. But even with that underneath the, the full body PPE suit, um, you're immediately drenched in sweat. And the idea was I'd do that, you know, a couple of times, put it on, take it off. Uh, and then she'd take me down to where the unit was. And it was uh, a real makeshift infectious disease unit. We'd repurposed the set, section of the emergency department or outpatients department, knock walls through, put beds in there um, and put a lock on the door uh, to stop people from, from getting out, unfortunately. Um, we went down. I got dressed again. And the most, uh, you know, overpowering smell was of chlorine. You know, everything was getting drenched in chlorine. We didn't have any proper uh, hand sanitizers. We didn't have any, you know, alcohol gels in short supply. So everything was bleach. Um, we would wash our hands in sort of diluted bleach concentration. Uh, we'd wash our PPE in diluted, slightly less diluted bleach concentration. Um, and if you made it up a little bit too strong, you'd end up getting chemical burns on your hands. So... For a lot of my time in Sierra Leone, I had pretty, uh, pretty bad hands, pretty bad skin that had been basically chemically burnt a lot of the time. Um, we went into the unit for the first time, and yeah, it's it's pr pretty impossible to explain what that was like. It, it, in fact, it is impossible to imagine uh, accurately how that looks if I describe it. Compare it to a, a hospital now, that you, you know, first world. Um, if you imagine walking into a ward in the UK, and instead of seeing what you would see in a ward in the UK, all you have is beds, and all you have is incredibly sick, dying people laying on those beds. There's maybe, if you're lucky, you've got a drip running on one of them. 
Um, but ultimately, people are just there and you're trying to convince them to drink water and eat food, which they find very difficult to do because they're incredibly unwell. Um, and there's only five of us as well at this point. So to manage this unit of about 12, we started off with 12 and very quickly ramped up to close to 20 beds in the same space. Mind, We didn't get any bigger space. Um, yeah. It's, it was essentially in those early days, there was very, very little that we could do if you got bought into us. The idea was that we would try and isolate people who met case definition for Ebola so that they didn't infect anyone else. Um, you know, we, there, wasn't a, there isn't a cure. There's no treatment for it. There's just what they call supportive treatment. So we're trying to manage your symptoms. So one of the things that happens when you have Ebola and one of the reasons it's so difficult to, to treat and to, to identify cases is it, it matches a lot of other diseases. So you, you end up feeling very generally unwell. Um, you have really chronic bad fatigue. Um, you're dehydrated. You are unable to eat. You don't want to eat. Those are some, you know, you've got a fever. Those are some of the first initial symptoms that you get. But that meets case definition for lots of diseases. So in order to stop them spreading the disease to other patients in the hospital or to other healthcare workers, anybody who, who ticks sort of three out of the five boxes ends up getting isolated uh, and tested for Ebola. And in these early days, as I say, um, we, again, we still had so few resources. Uh, everything was in short supply from PPE to medications. And we would treat people for malaria, we'd treat people for bacterial infections, um, just in case it was one of those things that was making them really sick. So they weren't, we weren't hopefully delaying their care by isolating and testing them but we were helping to protect uh, the rest of the hospital from coming into contact with them. Um, when we would test the patient, we'd take a blood sample and we'd send it off for testing. There was only one lab in, in, in range, I suppose you say, for us to use, and that was a good hour's drive outside of Freetown to get to it. And they could only do in the beginning about 20 samples a day, and we were isolating 20, 30, 40 people a day trying to get tests done. Um, and sometimes they'd lose the tests or they'd run out of reagent. And so, you know, it would sometimes take up to three weeks to get a test result back, uh, by which point lots of people had already died. Um, and if they died, and, and this is the other thing that's particularly distressing about Ebola is it's, I mean, no, no death is pleasant, but Ebola is a particularly horrible way to go. Um, in the later stages, you get very confused, you get very agitated. Um, and then you will essentially pass away having, I don't want to go into, into too much detail about it, uh, but it's, it's pretty horrific. And that's even if you're not bleeding from various orifices because the, the virus has managed to start breaking down those membranes. Um, but we would have to then wash the bodies in bleach to kill the virus to make it safe for us to handle the bodies. Um, so we'd then put them into body bags and we'd take them out of the unit, clean the bed down. And almost as, like not almost, as soon as that person was in a body bag and as soon as that bed had been bleached down, a new patient was in that bed. And um, often incredibly sick uh, and often uh, that patient too would probably die in those early days. We were just, yeah, it was, it was awful. Um, in Freetown itself at that time, there was only one burial team uh, for the entire city. So they were doing burials for both Ebola uh, cases, but also other people that were dying around the city from non-Ebola related illnesses. Um, and they could only manage to bury maybe five, five, maximum 10 people a day if you were really lucky. And we were seeing upwards to sort of 10, 15, 20 deaths a day in our facility. Uh, and as I say, there was only five of us. Um, and we had to manage it for 24 hours a day. Myself and Marta would work from probably seven in the morning until nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, and then we would have, uh, we had three, initially we had three Sierra Leone nurses working with us as well. We couldn't actually get any other staff to come and work with us. 
because of the level of fear, understandably, that there was around working with Ebola patients. Um, we also had two absolutely phenomenal uh, Sierra Leoneans who volunteered to come and work with us for free. Um, we, you know, myself and Marta and a couple of the other guys from Kings, uh, we would pay them out of our own money because there was no, at the beginning at least, there was no money available to pay them. And they would come in and they would help us clean the unit down, mop up the floors, clean the beds, uh, help us move bodies. Uh, and these are just two normal guys. Uh, one was in his 30s, Mohammed, uh, uh, and a guy in his 50s called Abdullah. Um, and honest to God, I mean, they, if, if you want to know what a hero looks like, it's, it's those two. They had absolutely no business getting involved in an infectious disease outbreak that could potentially cost them their lives. And for Abdullah, it, it did kill him. Um, but they, they saw that their country and they saw their countrymen needed help um, and they stepped up and they came forward and and one of the most amazing things that I've seen in, in the last few weeks is the amount of people in the UK both healthcare workers uh, and non-healthcare workers who have stepped up to the plate uh, to help people in need both their you know, volunteers in the community helping their neighbours out uh, nurses and doctors who, who don't do infectious diseases probably never envisaged that they'd be having to do something like they're doing now um, and they've all come forward uh, and they really have shown sort of the best in humanity, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so though that was our team in, in Freetown. And we would have one nurse on in the morning with us, one nurse in the afternoon with us, and then one nurse overnight would watch the unit whilst we weren't there. Um, but that was it. That, that was the five of us for at least three or four weeks before we got any other kind of help coming. Um, over time, we, we managed to ramp up the response. Uh, Ollie managed to come back quite quickly. He got Kings to agree to, to step up their response as well, uh, which they should be absolutely commended for. Um, and they brought more volunteers. They brought funding. Uh, Ollie did a fantastic job about raising the profile of the outbreak in the media. Um, so suddenly we started seeing things in the news back home about what was going on out there. And it started becoming more prevalent in people's minds. People started raising money. And the UK government, you know, thankfully started to send some help as well. Um, as that outbreak went on, uh, a decision was made by... Uh, Ollie and, and me and Master and, and the, uh, the guys at King's, that really what we needed to do was to get other healthcare facilities back open because at that point they'd all closed and the nurses weren't coming to work, doctors weren't coming to work because it was too dangerous and they were just dying in their droves. Um, so our strategy was if we built an isolation facility and a screening facility, uh, every hospital that we could, those hospitals could reopen safely and treat people for their regular illnesses um, and keep their staff safe at the same time. It also meant that we could start pulling cases out of the community and stopping them from infecting other people. Um, and we could start treating them. Um, you know, as the outbreak went on, we worked out that if we could safely do it, and we did manage to for a lot of patients, if we could get an IV line in and get fluids into them that way, they fared a lot better than obviously trying to get them to drink Orally. Um, so we could rehydrate the patients and we could help them to fight the virus themselves. So we saw some pretty good outcomes when we started doing things like cannulations. Uh, I do remember one particular uh, day, uh, bearing in mind as a student nurse, you're not allowed to do invasive procedures, which includes cannulation. So for three years, you know, I didn't cannulate anyone. Um, on, I think, day four or five of being in Sierra Leone, uh, we admitted three brothers uh, to the isolation facility. All three of them, we didn't have test results, but we could clearly see uh, they had Ebola. Um, and, you know, when we asked them about you know, where their parents were, things like that, they told us, oh, my mother and father have died, my auntie has died, everybody's died. Their entire household had been wiped out by Ebola already, and they were the only three uh, that had survived up to this point. So we admitted them to the unit. We did our best to take care of them. Uh, and the oldest boy, the 12-year-old, um, 
whose whose name I you know I, I remember all their names, but I won't say it. Um, he was the first person I thought. You know what? If we can cannulate him, he might do all right. So we got the kit, uh, and I remember going in, I dressing in full PPE. I've got my double gloves on. And at this stage of the outbreak as well, we're using old PPE that we pulled out of shipping containers that have been, you know, in the back of warehouses and in the sun for years. So the, the PPE is pretty, uh, pretty poor quality uh, and definitely past <laughs> sell by date. Um, but nevertheless, I, I go in, I've got the kit, uh, and put a tourniquet on his arm, explain what I'm doing. And, and he's a little confused. Um, but he's fairly docile. He's not really doing too much. So, you know, I find a vein, I get the needle in, I get it in first time, pin it down with my fingers. And as I'm putting the sharp into the sharp spin, I'm like, yeah, rock star, Andy, you still got it. You know, you, you're the best at this. Uh, and I turn around, <laughs> grab the tape. And when you, you know, when you cannulate somebody with a bowler, they bleed a lot, a lot more than a normal person would. So, it, you know, there's blood oozing out over the, over the cannula itself. Uh, and onto the glove um but i get the tape i tape it down i clean it up i get the line attached i get fluid running um and i go and i you know we double gloves so we have one set of gloves on and then obviously a second set over the top uh so i turn around i go and wash those gloves to take the outer set of gloves off and put a new set of gloves on before i move on to the next patient um, and as i'm washing those gloves i'm like oh my hand feels cold where's that and i look down and the state of the gloves that I was wearing, because they were so old, the rubber had perished. And so, like day three of being in Sierra Leone, uh, I had a kid who was positive for Ebola bleed directly onto my bare skin. Um, and you're just like, could anything else go wrong? Like, I'm going to be that guy who came out here for, for initially what was meant to be a three-week trip. And on day three, I've gone and got myself infected with Ebola. Um, but fortunately, you know, that wasn't the case. I didn't actually catch a bowler from him, but there was certainly, uh, it was a tense 21 days of sort of self monitoring, uh, afterwards to, to make sure I didn't develop any symptoms. How did uh, the kid do? He survived. All three brothers survived, uh, fortunately. Um, and that was remarkable. You know, we, multiple times whilst we were looking after them, both myself and Marta would come out of the unit, would, you know, would take off the PPE, would sit down and be like, no chance, they're, they're gone, they're not, we're not going to be able to save them. Um, but they fought and they fought really hard uh, and we managed to keep them together as well. Um, the only places that you could send an Ebola patient uh, from an isolation facility, like a proper the only sort of field hospitals available were far out in the east of the country in the two provinces that were initially hit with the virus, Kenema and Kailan. They were constantly overwhelmed. So we would call them every day and say, you know, do you have any beds available? Can we transfer you some patients? And it's a pretty horrific transfer as well. It's sort of 12 hours by road. You know, you'll be in the back of a vehicle with no air conditioning. There won't be a, a medic looking after you. It's essentially... Uh, a bus ride you know we're putting you in an ambulance that's got no one in the back and it's not going to stop until it gets to the other end and then the team there will take care of you so we really had to prioritize who was going to live and who was going to die and who was going to survive that that ride or not um unfortunately the three brothers we got them to a point where they we could see them improving I'm like well, this is, it's now or never we get them out of here and we get them to the, the treatment unit where there'll be a bit more space. There's more staff. Um, at that point, I think it was run by MSF. So they, you know, and they, at that time, and they still are, I think, frankly, sort of the world leaders at, at managing the bowler in, in such resource poor areas. So we managed to get them into that treatment center and they fortunately survived, um, <clears throat> which was really remarkable. And we, we, there's a, there's a number of really heartwarming and, and lovely stories of, kids and and people that we did save you know it wasn't all death and um, we did save a lot of lives and the the value of what we were doing i think really comes from the fact that we were able to start isolating people more and more pulling them out of the community and stopping them from spreading the infection on among their households so 
it wasn't all, you know, all the lives we saved wasn't just about the clinical interventions that we made. It was more about the strategic decisions we made as well. Um, but there were some, there were some really tough decisions, and and there's going to be some really tough decisions for the for the guys in the UK at the moment as well, because resources are in short supply. Everything from ventilators to dialysis machines, you know, people aren't just dying because their lungs are failing; they're dying because it's multi-organ failure. Um, so it's more they need more than just the ventilators they need the drugs they need the medications and they need the staff who are, again are in short supply so difficult decisions are going to have to be made and we, and we also um, we're having to make difficult decisions every day um, I vividly remember walking out the front gates of the hospital one morning to a, a, like a lean-to shelter we'd set up for people who presented to the hospital uh, but we didn't have any beds for them. They met case definition. We could see that they were sick. We could, could see that they you know, probably had Ebola. But at that point in time, we didn't have a bed to put them in. So they had to wait outside in the street, essentially. Um, but a bed would free up. And then one of us would go out. And somehow we would pick who we were going to take and put in that bed. And it was a real... Uh, dilemma there was no real strategy there was no sort of um, algorithm you could use to determine who you're going to take because if you took somebody who was really quite well and do it look like they're doing okay and isolated and tested them you know by the time you got the test result back they may have deteriorated or they may have got better and and gone but in the same time period uh, the person who was really sick out there has also been the highest viral load, as I said before, and those people are the most infectious. So who do we who do we take? Do we take the most infectious people who have got the least chance of survival, but they're out of the community and not infecting anyone else, or do we take the people who have got the most chance of survival and help them on their way to to recovering? Um, and so, as a twenty four year old uh, nurse. I'm having to stand in a street and decide who I'm going to choose to live and who I'm going to choose to die that day, uh, which which is really awful. It's not something I think anyone should ever ever have to do. Um, but I think there's going to be a few clinicians in the UK that are, you know that are going to have to start making those decisions, and they probably already are. I, I think it, I think I think it already is, mate. Um, th- yeah, I think it already is. It's definitely been spoken about in the news. Uh, I've seen. I mean, I interviewed a, an IT, a COVID nineteen IT ICU nurse a few days ago. I think she mentioned it on that podcast. It's it, it's just it's coming down to the decisions they're making, and, and now who's living and who's dying because of ventilator things, because of uh, ver- various various factors, mate. And the thing is with this is that you know, I mean, you were you, you were saying there about as a as a young nurse you. Just, just for context on this, you were saying as a, as a as a junior nurse, junior nurse, trainee nurse. What were you saying? Trainee nurse. You can't cannulate, but then go back when you were part of the med corps and attached to power in Afghan. You could do all of that. Right? I was doing that stuff when it was allowed as a just like a team medic or an old bod back in early yeah. early two thousand, and that stopped. Now the thing is with yourself is you've got some experience there in terms of dealing with trauma, dealing with things like that. I, no, hang on. Granted, the, the Ebola situation in Sierra Leone is, is, is one of a kind, so, but it's not the point of making. There's a, there's a, there's a big thing going to happen here in the UK, the USA, other parts of the first world, I think, where these people who, yeah, they work day in, day out in hospitals and, and, and in the health service. Uh, but, because of the, the way they're being stretched and because of the because of the way they're being stretched, the situation they're being put in and the decisions they're having to make are going to be hugely uh, hugely traumatic, I think. Hugely traumatic, I think. You're going to see a lot of issues after this. I, I hope we don't, but I think it's, I think it's the case. And um, I, feel, I feel for them. They're not, they, they didn't sign up to do that kind of thing, and yet they're being thrust into no. it. You know? It's... Um... I would I would equate it, you know, to a war. I mean, you know, Sierra Leone and, and, and Ebola was a was a war. We were fighting, not just for for our patients, but also to survive ourselves. 
um, and not get infected. And, and the, the guys in the UK are, are doing the same. And you're right, they've been put into a position that they've not, they've not experienced before, they've not trained for. Um, and they're going to have to, as teams and as cohorts, I really, really hope that they are considering as individuals and taking responsibility as individuals for their mental health. It's, it's going to be incredibly devastating if they don't. Um, I really neglected my own mental health uh, during Ebola um, and even after. The, you know, I'm still, there's still things about it that, that cut me up today. Um, you know, and I think I probably think about it uh, at least two or three times a day. And a year ago, I was thinking about it probably at least once or twice an hour. It was, it was you know, that vivid and, and still that big of a, an issue for me. Um, but the only way that these guys are going to survive and the only way that these guys are going to continue uh, to thrive in their, in their professional and personal lives is if they take responsibility right now uh, for their mental health and put strategies into place that are going to help them. And whether that's, you know, having that one colleague that you both sit down at the end of the day and make really inappropriate jokes about what just happened or whether that's, you know, going home and talking to your wife or talking to, to someone, anyone and, and getting the stuff off your chest. If there's one piece of advice I'd give them, it's, it's don't necessarily find someone who was in the same situation as you because often you'll talk about the same thing and you'll just spiral into this sort of negative spiral of, oh, that was terrible and it was awful and I really hate it and this is awful, you know. And you'll just go down and down. You need to find somebody that you can release to who will listen. Um, will you know, They'll be able to reflect similar sort of situations to you, but it won't be the same. Um, and fortunately, they won't then take that on board and sort of add to that. They'll help you relieve some of that pressure. It's really important that those, those healthcare workers look after each other and, you know, and really take notice of their mental health because it is going to be hard and people are going to fall and they need someone there to catch them when it happens that's yeah that definitely that's the one aspect of it the other, the other way that th things can be alleviated for them is if joe public flipping listen to what he's being told and absolutely follow it to the t because that would relieve the pressure on on the nhs and, and and in other countries i mean um well i saw it yesterday people are starting to relax slightly uh in you know locally where i live and uh, yeah. incredibly frustrating. I think as great as it was, Boris Johnson like pulling through, it, it might have given some people just like a false sense of, oh, it ain't that bad. <laughs> you know, it's all yeah. it's, it's, and it's um, you know, and that that's the problem. He's he's trying to do his best. You know, whether you love him or hate him as a politician, he's trying to do his best to to keep morale up i suppose within the country by you know and, and reassuring the nation as well again whether you support him or not he's trying to reassure the nation that as a as the leader of said nation he's okay he's doing all right he's still involved he's you know he's still about um however in doing so you're right people and i think now going to look at it and be like well you know if he, if he beats it i can beat it it'll be fine it's not that bad will crack on as normal. And unfortunately, that's not the case. You know, um, yeah, the, if people start slacking off on the social distancing, if, if the government starts to ease off these lockdown measures before it's, uh, before it's right to do so, there are going to be more spikes in cases and it's going to prolong the outbreak, you know, overall. I think the, the telling factor is going to be in about a week to two weeks' time when we see a spike in cases again, because everybody who decided to chin off the lockdown regulations during the really hot Easter weekend, that little cluster, that's going to be another cluster of infections that we'll only start seeing come out in about 14 days after that. So, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Unless the nation gets a grip and starts paying attention and, and keeps with it as well, it's hard. I get it. You know, you're stuck indoors. Being confined to any space is, is difficult for anyone. Um, you know, it's not easy for anyone, but you've got to do it. And if you don't do it, it's going to be worse, you know, and it's going to prolong this whole situation for everyone. I think what I think an interesting area to look at, place to look at, and definitely retrospectively when all this is over, but also now is the states where, where they're not the, the 
what do you call it? The government there, they're not able to blanket say, right, it, it, all the states are to lock down the same way social distance. They're not able to do it. It's done a state by state case. And I, I know that uh I know that one of the one of the places biggest hit with it. Where's the Mardi Gras? Where's the Mardi Gras happening? Where? New Orleans. That's it, New Orleans. So one of the places that's biggest hit was was New uh, has been biggest hit and having the biggest uh rates of infection and, and mortality is New Orleans. And one of the things they refused to do to, when it was getting big and Trump was saying uh when well at the point when Trump I think was saying it's not that bad. They decided to yeah. go ahead and have the Mardi Gras. They had the Mardi Gras and then it went through the roof. And it was another area of the same same situation. But I think it's gonna be interesting is to be able to compare the different states um against each other and the actions they took i mean new york has got it bad but they reckon new york got it from europeans so some some came from china to europe europe to to new york and that that's where it started but i mean um it's it just you just stay there just stay away from people man it's yeah <laughs> it, yeah and they're gonna it, it will be i think the yeah it's a tough one because Again, with the United States as a nation, with their their separate states, they're all they, you know they've all got land borders other than Hawaii, obviously, with it with other states, and so you're going to say a similar situation of imported cases into other states. You know, as one state gets free of COVID nineteen, they won't ever really be free because the state next door cases are going to start trickling across the border again because it's a land it's a land border, um, and so there's going to be little clusters erupting. It's going to take years before this is this is dealt with um, unless they bring out a vaccine and vaccines take a long time to develop i know there's been sort of posts in the media about oh you know we're 12 months away from a vaccine but it's potentially going to be longer they're probably 12 months away from when they can start testing a vaccine um, and we saw the same thing happen with ebola uh, you know we eventually got a vaccine for ebola it works really well but it took a long time uh, before it, we could roll it out on a wide scale and with the Ebola vaccine, there had already been before the outbreak some preparation work on that kind of on that kind of vaccine. So they were already slightly ahead of where we are now with with COVID nineteen, I think. Um. So yeah, I mean, it, it, there's lots of parallels. I think. Um, I think some of the the more interesting sides of life, and fortunately, from a medical perspective, we are seeing this. At the beginning of the Ebola outbreak, the focus was on. Uh, treating people who had Ebola, not really considering who those people were. They were just people and they had Ebola. And the same sort of thing happened, I think, initially with COVID-19. We were just trying to treat people with COVID-19. But now, very quickly, people have realised that it's not just your average Joe who catches COVID-19. and It's pregnant women. It's little kids. Um, it's all these various different demographics of, of people and sections of society, people with comorbidities and people with different diseases are catching COVID-19 as well. Unfortunately, uh, you know, if you take Israel for an example, their strategy for managing it, they've already right at the beginning had put in place systems to deal with you know, pregnant women, for example, who had COVID-19. It took me uh, six, mm, yeah, about six months from when I arrived in Sierra Leone to get the first, world's first maternity unit for Ebola patients set up. Um, and up until that point, those pregnant women were coming to our unit at Connaught Hospital in Freetown, and we we weren't a, a maternity unit. We didn't even have a, a midwife. Um, and the first child that I delivered from a, an Ebola positive woman was in that unit, and unfortunately, the child died. Um, but I mean, its chances of survival were pretty slim with with no maternity care available anyway. Um, so yeah, that was that was. Both of, that, that was a real negative for Ebola, but it's been a real positive that I've seen of COVID-19. People have identified that that's an area of healthcare that can't be neglected, and we do need to focus on that as well. So. Mm. Um, how did how did your Sierra Leone trip culminate? So uh, initially, the trip was only meant to be three weeks. Um, about a week after I got there, Air France, who I flew in with, uh, cancelled all flights. So I didn't have a, a flight out. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you the other day. 
the, the booking agent sent me an email and said, oh, you know, don't worry. Uh, Air France are still flying to Conakry, so you can get on a plane in Conakry. The problem is Conakry is in Guinea, which is a completely different country across a land border that you can't cross because they closed the borders. So that really wasn't any use to me at all. And after a couple of hours of fighting with this guy, trying to convince him that that's not really a suitable alternative and that he needed to refund me my airfare, um, I thought, screw it, I'll say then. So I ended up staying for uh, two years in the end. Um, so I saw it all the way How through to the end. Two, two years. years? Yeah. Did you, did you come home at all in, during that time? Uh, I, yeah, there was a couple of little blocks of R&R. &R. Um, we... I, you know, I met my now wife out there who was working for another organization um, and we went to Senegal for a weekend uh, on a UN. We managed to get on a UN flight to Senegal for the weekend. Um, but that, that was probably the longest break that we had um, until the outbreak was actually declared over. So. Oh, my God. I think in total, I, I tried to do the maths, but I never really kept an accurate count. But I, I, I treated in that sort of two year period. Um, or from November, sorry, from when I got there in June, July 2014 to when the outbreak was declared over in uh, November 2015. Um, I think in that time period, I, I treated close to, if not over, a thousand positive cases of Ebola um, across the various different facilities that I helped build and run. Um, and for me, the outbreak came to an end. I was working in so I, I went to work for another organization uh, called Partners in Health, it's a fantastic American organization. Um, and they asked me to go in and set up uh, the maternity unit in Freetown uh, so that they could deal with Ebola patients. Um, and that was a particularly tough job to do. One, because I'm not maternity trained in any way. Um, but two, because uh, pregnant women are really difficult to manage when they've got Ebola. Obviously, giving birth to children involves uh, a lot of bodily fluids, so it's incredibly high risk for clinicians to deal with. Um, there's an incredibly high risk of infection. And the only person up until that point that I'd known who had delivered a baby from a positive Ebola patient uh, was a nurse in Kenema, I think, uh, and she contracted the virus uh, and died. Um, and so it really didn't look... Uh, that safe a thing to be doing but equally when I first went down there to see what was actually happening at the maternity hospital uh, any woman who, who met case definition which was most women in labour um, if they arrived at the hospital meeting case definition they were usually just left in the car park to fend for themselves um, because there wasn't anyone in, who was willing to, to take care of them because everyone knew their chances as a clinician of, of surviving if they caught Ebola from a, a pregnant woman was incredibly slim. Um, fortunately, there was a very small cohort of maternity staff at that hospital who were doing their best to treat those women. And so we managed to very quickly recruit them, get them trained up, get them kitted up properly. And we built, a, we repurposed the building and, and turned it into an Ebola isolation facility that we could look after, manage and deliver children. In. And in the end, um, we delivered, I think, 12 children from positive mothers and over 80 children overall from women who otherwise would have been left essentially to die in a car park. Um, so that was quite a remarkable feat. And, and those women who stepped forward to deliver those kids um, and, the, and the other volunteers that worked with me to help do that as well, I, I just, I, I, I admiration for them. They're, they're absolutely amazing. Um, as the outbreak was coming to a close, uh, one of the other harder hit provinces in the Far East, uh, a province called Kono, their hospital had closed quite early on. They'd lost, I think, 80% of their medical staff had been infected. Um, oh the majority, the majority of those had died during the outbreak. So the hospital had collapsed and closed. Uh, and so the organisation wanted to go up there, get it reopened and, and get them seeing, uh, seeing patients again. So my last job in Sierra Leone uh, was getting that hospital reopened safely uh, to see patients, um, which was really cool to do, and it was really awesome to see uh, life returning to some sort of some sort of normality, and, and seeing people and kids and, and everyone else actually getting access to medical care again was, was pretty awesome. 
It was awesome, mate. It was awesome. I was like, when you, when I said, how long do you stay out there for? And you said two. I thought you were going to say two months, but two years. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. You know, I'm just looking at the time. We have to start close it down. But but it's been a pleasure to talk to you, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. He experiences on it, Sierra Leone, but also your knowledge uh, in relation to COVID-19. Um, I think two things are gonna, I'm going to – well, first thing to finish off with, mate, just – if you're going to say anything to people listening over here in the UK with this going on, with your knowledge of infection control, one piece of advice? Um, yeah, social distancing. It, it's it's key uh, to stopping the spread of the disease. Um, pay attention to, to the advice that you're being given. And it sucks, but adhere to it. I mean, if we don't get a grip of the outbreak now, it's going to go on for an incredibly long time. And for every person you see breaking the rules, breaking the lockdown rules, you know, that's a, that's a potential other cluster of cases that could infect you. It could infect your family. Um, so jump on them, get them top of them, explain it. You know, they are risking people's lives, not just yours and your families, but healthcare workers as well. If they get really sick and if they infect a, a member of uh, the healthcare workforce, you know, that's another critical, uh, an incredibly valuable and scarce resource that we may well lose. Um, and that's going to have a massive knock-on effect on how we deal with the overall outbreak and how how easy it is for you to access care if you need it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you, have you, is there anywhere people can find out more about your time out there in Sierra Leone? Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's plenty of stuff online. Um, there is a book uh, called Operation Ebola, uh, which is it's more for clinicians. If there's anyone clinical watching, it's quite interesting. It, it talks about um, the surgical aspects of, of what was being done during Ebola. It talks a little bit about my work with the maternity team in, in Sierra Leone. Uh, and there's lots of essentially short case studies and stories about how things were done out there. It probably, for, for those working clinically in this, it could be quite valuable for you to, to grab a copy. It's by a uh, by a doctor called Adam Kushner, put all the stories together, uh, and it's published by John Johns Hopkins Press, I think, um, and it's phenomenal. It, there's some really amazing stories in there of how how we dealt with um, various different situations uh, out there, and and some of it is transferable to what what those guys are facing now in the NHS. And um, there's another book by by Oliver Johnson and the former Irish ambassador to Sierra Leone, Sinead. Um, they, they did an overall uh, study on the entire outbreak and the response to it in Sierra Leone. And if you want to know how that, how, you know, the intricacies of that response and how it works and, and sort of the broader impacts of that, that's definitely a good book to get. Um, there are some really great journalists out there at the time, a guy called Tommy Trenchard uh, and Ben C. Solomon from the New York Times as well. They did some really great uh, pieces Ben's work, uh, he did some excellent stuff in Liberia, in Monrovia, so obviously not Sierra Leone, but it will give you a very good idea of what we were facing in uh, in Sierra Leone. If you, I think if you Google Ben C. Solomon, uh, Monrovia, he's got some, some amazing videos uh, and some articles up there, uh, so it's definitely worth a look. Where can people catch you online? Uh, in life? Uh, uh, no, online, online. Um, LinkedIn. Uh, cool. You know, it, it, probably the easiest one. Um, I'm on Facebook, but I probably I'm, I'm not very interested. In Facebook. <laughs> you wouldn't have had me. Um, yeah, uh, and I think I've got an Instagram which I occasionally post to. There's actually some good pictures on Instagram of, of you know the places that I've been and the things that I've done. Obviously, since uh, Sierra Leone, I've also been in uh, where else have I been? I've been in uh, Ethiopia uh, working on cholera responses. I was in Mosul in 2017 as the offensive pushed through to clear out ISIS from Mosul. Um, I've been in Somalia for the last two years working out there. You know, I'm, I'm in Eastern Europe at the moment working on on various projects out here as well. So if you want to look at that, it's uh, Feed Your Soul Adventure on Instagram. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, take, take a look. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise. I will catch you. I will catch you in the UK for a beer one day. Definitely, definitely. I'll, I'll make you wash your hands first. <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Mackie. Stay safe, bud. You too. Take care, mate.